Uh, about six months ago, we were having dinner, and my wife and I had recently returned from a trip to Cuba with the young woman standing on my right. Uh, over dinner, we talked about what's happening in Cuba, and Ben thought it might be interesting to have a session at Kent Presents on this subject. Uh, I went to Sandy, uh, who is a friend who has led hundreds of trips to Cuba, who first went to Cuba in 1969 and a short vignette. Um, she was helping pick sugar cane as a, cut sugar cane, excuse me, as a uh, young woman and she fell ill in the field. And who came to her rescue and took her to the hospital but Fidel Castro. He <laughs> so uh, Sandy has, uh, runs a not-for-profit in New York called the Center for Cuban Studies, which brings uh, cultural and artists, cultural personalities and artists to New York. She's done it for a long time. She knows more about Cuba than most Americans, and she's going to introduce our two guests this morning. Thank you, Dwight. <laughs> this is very funny to be introduced, to be introduced, to be introduced. But, um, and Dwight's made it very clear, I have 30 seconds. So I want to say only a couple of things. First, um, my friend Pepe Vieira here, known officially as Jose Vieira, uh, was the first Cuban I ever met. Um, he was at that time at the Cuban mission to the United Nations. And he actually was the person who arranged my very first trip to Cuba because at that time, one of the only ways you could travel to Cuba legally was to be invited by the Cuban government. So he arranged an invitation for me. So I have, <laughs> I have Pepe to thank or curse for having the same job <laughs> since 1972 of running the Center for Cuban Studies. Um, but I think that one of the blessings of my life um, has been my association with Cuba and certainly my association with Pepe Vieira. I think you are all very privileged today to have the chance to know one of the people who I think is one of the smartest analysts about what's going on in his country and what might go on in his country. So I have absolutely no problem in introducing you, Pepe, and I hope I've Am I within the 30 seconds? No, I'm beyond it. But um, I, there is so much more to say about these two people. But that's one of the most important things that I want you to know about Pepe Vieira is that he's one of the most important people you'll ever meet from Cuba. And Bill Leo Grant is someone I've known almost as long, right? I mean, the Cuba people tend to stay together for a long time. And in this country, Bill knows as much as you'll ever want to know about Cuba. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't tell you to all go and buy his book, Back Channel to Cuba, which is available here, I understand, and which will surprise you because you will find out how much relationship has gone on between the United States and Cuba during all of these decades when we did not have any relationship with Cuba. So you're, you're lucky today. Oh, you, that's right. Dwight, Dwight, you played your role beautifully, and we didn't even know that was going to be your role. <laughs> so I've, I feel privileged to be here in order to introduce these two marvelous friends. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Sandy, for the, for the introduction. We're going to start out with uh, an audience response uh, vote on a, a proposition, and we'll, we'll vote again on it at the end of the session. Should the United States lift the embargo on tourism, trade, and investment in Cuba? So on December 17, 2014, President Obama and President Raul Castro really shocked the world by simultaneously announcing that Cuba and the United States had agreed to begin a process of normalizing their relationship after half a century of animosity. 
And since that time, things have actually moved very rapidly on the diplomatic front. Uh, Cuba was taken off the State Department's list of state sponsors of terrorism. We reopened embassies in one another's capital uh, just a, a little over a year ago. Uh, President Obama actually went to Cuba on a state visit in March of this year. And the US embargo on Cuba has been not, uh, not repealed. It's still in place. But the president, uh, using his regulatory authority, has punched a number of holes in it. So there are more and more opportunities for uh, people in the United States to do business with Cuba uh, every day. And of course, there's been a surge of US visitors to Cuba. Uh, a double, this year, double the number uh, last year, which was also 77% higher than the year before. So there is uh, what some people in Cuba call a tsunami of American visitors coming to the island. And yet there are still obviously many issues uh, that divide our two countries. Uh, as I say, the embargo is, is still in place, which means that uh, Americans cannot invest in Cuba and Cuba cannot export to the United States. Um, there are uh, a variety of issues that are left over from the, the 50 years of hostility, uh, programs in which the United States government tries to foster opposition to the Cuban government, uh, TV and Radio Marti, which broadcast uh, anti-government messages into Cuba. Uh, we have issues around migration, and if you've been reading the newspapers, you know that there has been a, uh, an increase in Cuban migration to the United States, particularly through uh, uh, Central America and Mexico to the Texas border. And of course, there's the issue of human rights, of uh, which our two countries have very different conceptions. Well, all these diplomatic changes have been taking place within uh, a context of fundamental change in Cuba itself. Uh, Cuba, since 2011, has been in a process uh, that Cubans call updating their economy, uh, moving away from the hyper-centralized model of socialist planning that they adopted from the Soviet Union in the 1970s toward more of a market socialism on the model of Vietnam or, or China. Uh, that has also been accompanied by a degree of what I would call political decompression, and we'll talk about what, what that entails. Um, and very importantly, uh, we're in a period of transition, of generational transition, between the generation that made the revolution in 1959, Los Historicos, the historic generation that founded the current government, and a new generation of, of leaders. Uh, Fidel Castro has already retired. Raul Castro will step down as president in 2018 and presumably step down as head of the Communist Party in 2000. 21, and, and that will pose real new challenges for, for the Cuban government. So I, I want to start talking about the economic reform process. Cuba in the 1990s went through a terrible depression as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, gross domestic product fell some 35 uh, percent. Cuba's uh, uh, um, income per capita fell even more than that. And it was a period of real privation. And in some ways, the, the economy is still trying to recover from, from what was called the special period. Now the economic reform process that's, that's underway um, has been compared to China and, and Vietnam. Uh, and, and so, Pepe, let me ask you, is, is that an accurate description? Is, uh, what, what is the nature of the, the, the new model that uh, Cuba is pursuing on the economic front. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, I would like to start thanking uh, Dwight and Sandy for bringing the <coughs> idea of this uh, uh, possibility to talk about Cuba, and to Donna and Ben Rosen for their invitation or the initiative to have this incredible, I couldn't imagine how much I, w I was going to learn in three days in Kent. Uh, <laughs> my wife and I have enjoyed it, and uh, not only enjoyed it, but really open mind. I mean, it has given us new ideas, and uh, uh, we had 76 year old, it's, it's not very easy to get new and new ideas, <laughs> but <laughs> we have got many. Very properly, 
uh, a bill has started by mentioning Cuban-American relations, because even if we are going to talk about changes in Cuba, and this is the main issue, there is no way of talking about Cuba policies, uh, international, internal, without referring to the United States. That is not to say that uh, whatever happens in Cuba is the United States to blame. Actually, uh, President Raul Castro, in his uh, speech to the last uh, Congress of the Party this April, he said that the main obstacle to changes in Cuba is the refusal or, or the heart to accept new idea but by uh, cadres and functionaries in the government and the party. He didn't say it because of the American embargo, that we call blockade. He didn't say it because of the American embargo. He said our own inability to change our minds. Uh, and uh, this relation between Cuba and the United States, as uh, President Obama in his excellent speech, the 17th of December, of 2014 is a wonderful speech. I don't know in English, but uh, the ideas, I mean, I don't know the beauty of the language, but certainly the idea, the way he presented, the perception about Cubans to receive the, his message were excellent. And he mentioned in the second paragraph, after saying that we are starting a new relation with the Cuban people, he said, Cuba and the United States has a complicated history. That's close to be an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> the, the British occupied Havana in 1762. Till that moment, Cuba, as a Spanish colony, was not a producing colony. I mean, it was not a colony that will produce wealth. A little tobacco, some sugar, salted meat, but mostly was a military and naval base for Spain and its big uh, 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 imperium, the big domains in uh, Latin America. That were the richest one, Mexico, Peru, etc. The British changed that. They imposed on Spain the importation of slaves, the production of sugar, and opening the market. Cuba was supposed to, uh, the foreign trade of the island at that moment was only with Spain. It opened with the United Kingdom. That included, of course, the 13 colonies that were about to become the United States. And relation between both countries that started. And also a population came to the island. Till that moment, Cuba has only a quarter of a million inhabitants. In the next uh, 40 years, we jump it to one million. And there was the potential for a nation. Uh, so you don't know exactly, even uh, many Cuban historians will criticize me for that, whether we were a nation to start to produce sugar, but because it was necessary to produce sugar and the United Kingdom imposed it in Cuba, we came to be a nation. What was first, sugar or nation? It's complicated, as a many things in our history. Relation with the United States had started, and they jumped very quickly. Spain supported the American Revolution, and uh, Havana was a major base for that help. Uh, and Spain accepted economic relations and trade with the United States. And that really gave the final punch to a nation, a Cuban nation, who has started to define its own identity. And to define our own identity, we have the strong African roots, strong Spanish roots, and American cultural influence. Baseball, a very political issue in the, 18th, in the 19th century in Cuba. Very political issue now in Cuba. President Obama went to Cuba, he went to see baseball with Raul Castro. Uh, baseball was so important defining our identity that by 1860 we already have 
baseball players, organized baseball in Cuba. Not because there were American troops like in Taiwan or in South Korea, no, it was brought by the Cubans who were already living in Tampa, mostly not Miami yet, but Tampa, Key West, and also New York. And they brought baseball, and baseball became a symbol of a difference with Spain. If you wanted to be different from the Spaniard, you will go to baseball. If you wanted to be pro-Spanish, you will go to bullfighting. <laughs> and the um, debate in the papers of that time shows very clearly these two different things. If somebody was writing about baseball, he was really writing about Cuban independence. Mm -hmm. If he was writing in favor of bullfighting, he was writing in favor of the colony. So this gives you an idea. I mean, the presence of the US culture in Cuban identity is huge. It's not something that is rejected today. Only a few months ago, there was an excellent article in the main paper of the party, Grandma, by a professor of the University of Havana, explaining this, explaining how our own identity was conformed with these different components, including the American cultural uh, influence. So America became, the United States became a main market for sugar, a provider of technology. Spain did they have it. Railroads were in Cuba before than in Spain, even though we were the colony and they, they, they were the potential, uh, the, the, the power. But they, we had railroad first, British money and Creole families' money, and American technology and American technicians going to Cuba in the 1860s. 1837, 1837, more than 5,000 Americans per year would go. And very soon the relation was people to people. Now it's a policy of the American government to have people to people relation, but they started then, and it was a natural way of things. Let's jump very quickly and say that this created difficulties with the time because in the American mind, the main uh, leader of the United States and thinker of that moment started with President Jefferson and uh, John Quincy Adams, who was Secretary of State some time, and other presidents. They both mentioned this island is so situated in such a place that it has to be in our hands. Either Spain or us. It excluded, of course, in the first place, the United Kingdom. It was a big worry for the United States at that time. But it also excluded the Cubans themselves to be the master of their own country. When we started our war of independence, that was war very hard, we were, we thought, we fought three wars, three generations, the country was devastated three times. Cuban family lost their possessions, their life, the last one started in 1895. When it started, Jose Martí, our main thinker to today, he said this is to achieve independence from Spain and avoid having the island under the control of the United States. So he was fighting against Spain with an eye put in the United States. And the United States came into the war in 1898. We saw that we were about to win. We still think so. And the United <laughs> States came, came into the war, and we didn't achieve independence. The American flag took the place of the Spanish flag, and not the Cuban flag. And a semi-colonial status was imposed in Cuba, what was called the Platt Amendment. So when Fidel went into Santiago de Cuba in 1959, and he said, this time the rebel, the Mambises, as were called the Cuban freedom fighters in 1898, will not be stopping in coming to Santiago. He didn't have to say because the American, after we helped them to land in Siboney and Daikiri Beach, Daikiri was not a drink yet, it was only a beach where the American landed. <laughs> 
uh, to help Cuba Libre, who was also not a, a drink yet. It was a very, very popular slogan in the United States, very strongly supported by the American people, who went to die voluntarily to help the Cuba. Only the, the government of the United States did not help the Cuba. It took control over Cuba. They say, Fidel said, this time the Cuban will not be stopped in coming into the city because in 1898, the Cubans were not allowed to come into Santiago de Cuba or in other, any other city. There were American troops were the ones who marched on the city. A huge humiliation. When you go to Havana, you will see a monument in the Malecon that was erected in 1948, 1950, long before the communists were there. It's about this issue. So this issue do not belong to a communist party. These are national issues. When Fidel said, we are coming ourselves to Santiago, he became, as you say in English, we don't have the expression in Spanish, larger than life for the Cuban. He has completed the task that was started in 1868 by our great, great grandfathers. And he immediately moved to economics and social changes that were long looked for by the Cubans. The agrarian reform was the first one. It was in, even in our constitution since 1940 that the government has to carry on an agrarian reform. And he did it in the 19th of, uh, of uh, May of, uh, uh, no, 19th of March of 1959, only three months after being in power the revolution. But to do an agrarian reform in Cuba, you had to affect American interest. Mm -hmm. Only the United Fruit Company in the province of Holguin, in one, he had, they had two sugar mills, Boston and Preston. In the Preston, uh, in this sugar mill, 27,000 pe people live in the fields. No way of doing an agrarian reform without affecting American interest. Mm -hmm. And the reaction of the United States was the first sanction. Let, let me just jump, yeah. in, jump in here because uh, Raul Castro at, at one point was asked, what was the origin of, of the, the intense conflict between Cuba and the United States? And he, said, and he said, in response, we crossed the Rubicon when we passed the agrarian reform, precisely because of, 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 of this issue. And then, as we know, the relationship from, from there went sort of spiraling downward as, as, the, uh, as the United States, at that point in its history, simply couldn't accept the idea that Cuba would be independent, that it would not respond to US will and, 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 uh, and, and U.S. demands. And one of the things that I think is interesting, I want to try to bring us to the present, one of the things that's interesting is, is uh, you know, the president said on December 17th uh, that the old policy of hostility was way past its expiration date. Um, and, and I think that was true, and I, and I think most people looking back on it now would agree with that. But that sort of you know, requires us to ask, well, why did it take us 50 years then to come to, uh, to the realization that the policy was passed, its expiration date? Um, and I think on the US side, and I want you to, 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 to in, in a minute, to reflect on what the motive was on the Cuban side for, for the, the change in the relationship. But on the US side, uh, there were a couple of things. And, and one important one was the changes underway in Cuba today. I think President Obama saw an opportunity uh, with the policy of engagement to now actually have a beneficial effect on uh, making it easier for Cuba to make the kinds of changes uh, that Raul Castro has, has set in motion. But that wasn't the only reason. Uh, he was also under a lot of pressure from Latin America. In 2012, he went to the summit of the Americas, which was in Cartagena, Colombia, and the, other, the Latin American heads of state were unanimous in telling him that if Cuba was not brought into the summit process, reintegrated into the hemispheric community fully, 
there wouldn't be another Summit of the Americas. The summit process would come to an end. And I think it was at that moment that the President and, and Secretary of State Clinton as well realized that our ongoing policy of hostility towards Cuba, an anachronism left over from the Cold War, was really damaging our relationship with the rest of the hemisphere. And it was shortly after that, of course, the president was reelected and, and then uh, told his aides that in his second term, improving relations with Cuba was something that, that was high on his agenda. But of course, as all of us know, uh, having a good po policy reason for doing something doesn't always lead to change. You need the politics to be well aligned as well as the logic of, of policy. And historically, of course, it was the political influence of Cuban Americans in South Florida that had blocked any real major shifts in US policy, especially during the Clinton administration. Uh, but that had begun to change by, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the new century. Uh, successive waves of migration had brought more and more Cubans to the United States for economic reasons rather than for the political reasons that people left in the 1960s and even into the 1970s. And the, the new arrivals uh, were people who still had family in Cuba, who sent them remittances, who wanted to be able to travel back and forth. And for those Cuban Americans, a more normal relationship between our two governments was a good thing because it made it easier for them to maintain those family ties that were important to them. And for a long time, this didn't manifest itself in, in voting behavior. You could see it in public opinion polls that were being taken uh, regularly among the Cuban American community that gradually people with more moderate views uh, had become a majority of the community. And yet, in elections, you didn't see that. And of course, the reason was that it takes time for a person to become a naturalized citizen. It takes time for people to register to vote. And older people, as we know from one of the, uh, from, from Charlie Cook's panel, older people tend to vote more often than younger people. And so it was that older segment of the community that still held political control for a really long time. But you could see that that was beginning to change in 2008 when President Obama won 35% of the Cuban American vote running on a moderate policy towards Cuba saying he would meet with Raul Castro. Um, and then even more so in 2012 when he won uh, half the Cuban American vote, more than any Democrat had ever won before. So the change in US policy, it seems to me, is, it, is the president saw an opportunity to have a positive effect in Cuba uh, he saw an opportunity to improve our relationship with Latin America, and he saw that the political path to do this had been opened up by the changes in South Florida. So I think that was the motivation on the U.S. side. But what, uh, what on the Cuban side was the motivation for, for going back to a relationship of engagement rather than persisting in this hostility that we've had for so long? Well, it was never the goal of the revolution, as, as far as I see it, to develop a political of hostility with the United States. Uh, I, is that not to mean that the Cuban leadership, the main leadership, was not Marxist-Leninist and that they didn't want to make a socialist revolution, but not necessarily in an open hostility with the US. Maybe that was impossible, but that was a reality. Never was a propaganda done to bring the Cuban to a position of hostility against the people of the United States. Uh, we moved to socialism as a reaction to the sanctions. We moved very quickly. We nationalized everything, every single thing in economic activity in Cuba. All services, all production came on state hands. And uh, social, the redistribution of wealth was done through social uh, program, not personal income. We tried to develop a new man. We overregulated the economy, and at some moment, we started to try to regulate personal life. That was a mistake. Uh, sometimes I speak of we, sometimes I speak of them. Uh, <laughs> when I say we, I included bad decisions that were taken <laughs> in the past, and I was part of them, <laughs> even indirectly. Uh, when I speak of them, I am speaking what they do now that I don't like. 
so we did a lot of mistakes. And uh, we moved to areas we shouldn't never have moved. Uh, and we copy Soviet system of economic, but also some political practices that were not good at all. Blacklist of writers, blacklist of uh, painters, blacklist. It, locally, it ended around the beginning of the 80s, completely. The Cuban intellectual called that area the gray period, sometimes, some of them. Another one called them the black period, not the gray period. Uh, we moved out of it. And the economy looked like a worker. We got, we got a lot of help from the Soviet Union. We were the beautiful socialism. We were friends in Latin America, friends in Africa. Uh, we had adopted socialism by ourselves. It was not imposed by Soviet tank, tanks and troops like in Eastern Europe. It was our socialism. And we were able to defend it by ourselves. So the Soviet Union gave us $3 billion in aid every year besides special prices for our pro We deserved the 3 billion. We were very good allies. And, <laughs> very <laughs> and we did everything by ourselves, by our own decision. But the system didn't work. The system was unable to generate wealth. We did beautiful programs, social programs. But we didn't, were able, and we are not able to sustain them by ourselves. So after the Soviet Union disappeared, that you mentioned, there was a crisis. And we have not get out of that crisis. And the crisis moved from just economic to social life. Social norm, social relation has been, not social relation, I mean the respect for social regulation, for social, for culture, the respect of uh, work ethic, uh, the clear conception of what is legal and what is illegal. They have disappeared as you need the black market and you need uh, to make more money than what you get paid in your salary. And so it was a very dangerous situation and that is why Fidel called for, not, he didn't call for changes, he doesn't even, he doesn't even like the word changes. And never has he said we make a mistake. I, I don't think he will ever <laughs> say it. Uh, but he opened the door for a changes. And Raul came to power in 2008, and he started the changes. And this was helped because the new American president, the new Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and the next one, Kerry, never used hostile language with Cuba. And this creates an atmosphere that will help the changes. Now, after the President Obama trip to Cuba, after the, this creates even a better atmosphere for the changes. So the motivation in the Cuban side is that the, we need the changes, which, because our socialism has not been successful in the ability to create new wealth for the society. It's good to distribute what we have, but not to create new wealth. And we need new wealth. So the change is, you ask it, what are the main changes? The main change is that we are back to accepting that it has to be private property. And this private property has to be protected by law. And they have to be, for the moment, small and medium-sized private co uh, uh, companies. And they have to be able to work on the protection of law. Only that the law is moving slowly. And I, it doesn't happen with everybody in agreement in the government. You can see, we don't like to talk about this. And uh, I mean, in general in Cuba, you don't see talking about this. But it's obvious that there are people in the government who favor more changes and people who are afraid of the changes. And uh, the historical leadership is passing away. A new generation of people is coming to govern. I won't call them leaders, because Raul Castro is not only Fidel's brother. He was a very successful commander against Batista in the Civil War. And he was a very able minister of defense. And he created the Cuban Armed Forces, which is one of the most respected institutions in Cuba. They are the inheritor of the rebel army, the one that went in Santiago de Cuba. 
and the people who are now coming to be presidents, not yet first secretary of the party. In 2018, we will have a president and a first secretary of the party. And the party in Cuba, according to the Constitution, is the superior force that guides society. Lawyers can go crazy. What means a superior force? And what means to, be, to give guidance to society? It's under the law or above the law, the party. This is a big complication for the future, for the media future. So we had this uh, situation in which these people will come to rule, but they don't have the moral and the historical uh, authority like Raul have to lead the people. We will know in a few years whether they are leaders, and it will depend a lot how the economy is doing. Now that we have a private sector that right now is 25% of the working force of the country and it will move very quickly to 30%. And it's obvious that it will probably be producing around 30% of the gross national product. The taxes already pay for 10% of the national budget. So this private sector is growing. And Raul promises in the speech in the, in the last Congress that they will be protected legally. And they have to be. Because if not, the money they are making is going to end in Miami. Mm. Relations between Cuba and Miami are very porous. I was talking with Tom last night. I told him, in the plane, my Cecilia, my wife and I came to Miami. There were 15 children, children traveling alone. Eight were coming back after spending summer in Cuba. Seven were coming to spend August with the families in Miami, 15 children. And we have 900,000 travelers between Miami and Havana, even without the American being allowed to go to Cuba. Cubans are allowed to come to the United States, let me say, without permission. So we are more free than you are. <laughs> 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 even without the American with freedom to travel to Cuba, 900,000 visitors. If people in the private sector in Cuba do not get legal protection, if banks do not become banks, they will send the money to Miami as they did in 1958. In 1958, there were 80 million Cuban dollars in Miami because people were worried about the civil war. That will be like $400 million today. Well, the new private sector in Cuba will put $400 million in Miami very quickly if they don't feel protected by law. So they have to have protection, and they have to have a voice. How they're going to make it is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so let me, uh, before we turn to the questions, let me say a little bit about uh, the current state of, of the effort to normalize relations, because it's a process still underway. Um, since the, the reestablishment of diplomatic relations a, a year ago, uh, the two governments have signed 11 bilateral uh, agreements of cooperation on issues ranging from postal service to environmental protection and cooperation on counter-narcotics. Uh, there are six working groups or task forces that are looking, are sort of coordinating the overall process of, of dialogue. And over two dozen uh, conversations or tables of technical talks trying to actually take some of these broad principles that are being signed in memorandum of agreement and turn them into actual uh, efforts at, at cooperation. And yet there are still major issues, as I mentioned before. The fact that the embargo is still in place and can only be lifted by an act of Congress. Uh, what the president has done in the last 18 months is to punch holes in it using his executive authority to make exceptions to the embargo, but the overall embargo itself was uh, put into law in 1996, and as a result of that, uh, it's going to require an act of, of Congress. Um, there's a, di a dialogue about claims, because we have claims against Cuba for all the property nationalized uh, in the 1960s, and Cuba has counterclaims for all the damage done to the Cuban economy by uh, the embargo. Uh, Cuba wants Guantanamo back, 
Uh, it is sovereign Cuban territory. We recognize that. Yeah. But the United States also insists that the 1934 treaty that gives us the right to stay there in perpetuity uh, it still, has, still has force. And then, of course, there is uh, the, the issue of, of human rights. Let me say, though, that uh, importantly, 60% of the American people today support the new policy towards Cuba. 50% of Cuban Americans support it. And I would say that about 90% of Cubans support it, would okay. be my guess. Well, yeah, you are uh, uh, low. I mean, you're low there. Uh, not, not 99%. I, mean. I, was, I was in Havana uh, on December 17th, 2014, and I saw how, how ordinary people reacted, people crying, hugging one another, dancing in the streets. Church bells rang across the city. There was so much excitement that this 50 years of hostility had, had finally, finally come to an end, or at least was beginning to come uh, to an end. Um, so let me invite uh, questions from the audience. Can, let, yeah, can please, I, go ahead. Uh, yes. yeah, sure. Can I say something? Uh, even if there are two or three complicated issues about uh, uh, compensation for nationalization, for Cuba has paid everybody else in the world. <clears throat> everybody else. Only American company, because the refusal of the U.S. to negotiate about it, has not been paid. Actually, they have been paid because they got, by the Americans, because they got uh, special tax uh, deductions. Uh, so they are not longer as, as company interested. It's the debt now is with the American government, not with the private. Now, we have paid everybody else. And let me say another thing. We have advanced a lot in all other issues. And being so close to the United States, and as Jefferson said, I look at Cuba and I see it as a natural extension of the US. It is our benefit that it is like that. It's also a huge political problem to keep our identity and independence. But it's true. Cooperation in health, weather forecast, uh, Education, uh, whatever you mention, is going to be, as long as there is respect for Cuban independence, is going to be as full as it can be with any other country that you can consider in the world. Even in security, security and military issues. I have 25% of my grandsons there, <laughs> sitting. <laughs> he lives in Manhattan. And I have another 25% of my son who is finishing a, a master's degree in Bard, Bard College in uh, Annadale on Hudson, close to here. Do you think I'm not interested in US security? <laughs> as much as I'm interested in Cuba yeah. security. Yeah. And that's the same for the overwhelming majority of Cuban family who has half the family or 75% of the family in the United States. So let me make that clear. There are complicated issues, but the possibility of cooperation, as long as there is respect for Cuban independence, is unlimited. So some questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone to come. Right here, yes, in the front. And, and what we'll do is we'll take two or three at a time so that we uh, can, can get several in. Actually, yeah. this kind of refers to your grandson in a way. What do you, how could you characterize what the new leadership, what young people in Cuba, who will those leaders be? How, what is that kind of point of view having grown up um, under this system? And do you think that many uh, Cubans who have been to the United States and studied young will come back to Cuba? Okay. Now let's take a, take a couple more. Yes, you're here. Hi, enjoyed that very much. Um, you didn't mention ballet where Cuba excels. I'm, I, I will be on my third trip to Cuba in the fall to go to the International Ballet Festival. But what has worried me is that you used to have a wonderful agricultural tradition which faltered under collective farming. And as one drives through central Cuba, there's, there are thousands of acres lying fallow that yeah. used to be farmed. There used to be big dairy farms. Um, and so I'm wondering what you think is the right path to get back agriculturally. I live in Key West, 
Uh, our Coast Guard uh, interdicted 5,000 uh, people trying to flee Cuba this last year, and it's probably going to be higher yeah. this year. And I, we I don't, don't want to cut you off, but we're very short yeah, on time. Okay. okay. But <clears throat> if all those young men, and they're mostly young men, were farming, it would be wonderful. <laughs> okay. Right, right, uh, right behind you there. Yeah, I have a, a question. Uh, could you please comment on the U.S. view towards um, human rights in Cuba, specifically with respect to political prisoners, and the Cuban view towards the same matter? Uh, okay, and we'll take one more of the gentleman over here in the yellow jacket, and then we'll we'll try to answer them in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> This could be answered very quickly or another 45 minutes. Uh, how close to the uh, Chinese uh, mainland economic model do you think Cuba will grow to? Uh, well, let me say this. Uh, we, as I said before, we created a system that socially was very successful and people like it and they still like it till now that the, the strong basis of the revolution are the defenders, uh, defense of the independence of the country and that it has solved many social problems. Some of them not completely. We don't have racial tensions in Cuba, but we do still have racial differences because the incapacity to create new wealth has not solve the problem of uh, stratification of society. White is still live better than black. We have to grow the economy, to bring together, uh, as we have done politically and socially, the Afro population of African origin. We don't say Afro-Cuban because we are Cubans. There were black who achieved the independence of the country. 90% of the army fighting in Spain was black. So. We, they, are, they don't have to say Afro-Cuban. They own the name Cuban as much as the white. So we, as not having solved this problem, these people, young people cannot make personal plans. And this is playing a lot of people traveling abroad. It's not only that the other country is richer, and the United States is an attraction even for, I mean, you don't have to be communist in a communist country to want to come to America, as the Mexicans or the Salvadorians. One of you candidates want to put a wall to stop uh, uh, Mexicans from coming. <coughs> I mean, Cubans come because we didn't create the possibility to personal dreams. I think we are moving to create the space so that the young people can dream their life. Uh, I will add that. Uh, you cannot change the economy. You cannot, after abolishing private property completely, you cannot create again private property. You cannot move and change the way people have lived for so many years because we are about to end the rationing book. We have been eating from a rationing book for 60 years. It was good in terms of a poor country. Everybody had some food, but it was a limitation an egalitarian that didn't create the incentive to work and eat better. Uh, so these change, economic changes bring political changes. Only that they will not be negotiated with anybody. And of course, anybody in the case of Cuba means the United States. <laughs> uh, uh, they won't be negotiated. They, we can talk about, and actually one of the commissions that uh, Bill mentioned it, deal with uh, human rights issues. Yeah. But then we will have it to do it at our own time. Yeah. Let, me jump, I, I mean, so let me jump in, because we're, 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 okay. we're about I'm out of sorry. time. I just, wanna, I just wanted to, to, to say, with regard to the human rights issue, um, the, uh, the, the U.S. position, of course, is, is not to have given up on the issue of human rights. I mean, some people have criticized the president for having normalized relations without extracting concessions. But as you've just heard, Cuba is not going to agree to normal, uh, to, to, to negotiate those, those kinds of issues. But I think the president does have a strategy 
uh, in which if we create, we the United States, create an environment in which Cuba feels less threatened and Cuba is able to uh, it, it build its economy and, and strengthen its own internal systems, that uh, that will create an environment in which Cubans themselves will produce political changes that will lead to a more, a more open society. Oh, at first we have to vote. So, all right, so let's vote once again. Um, should the United States lift the embargo on tourism, trade, and investment in Cuba? All right, and let's see the results. Yes. Oh, but it looks like it looks like we alienated some people actually. <laughs> so, uh, nobody's uncertain. Well, that's a good thing, I guess. And thanks all to you all for coming. Thank you.